Please, number one, name and profession and your question. I am R.S. Yadav. I am a diplomat in the Indian Embassy. With due respect to all the people and ladies present in the hall, I am just going to express a view which I would like Dr. Zakir to carry with him because he has an access to the world audience. Dr. Zakir started by saying that for a dialogue amongst various civilizations or various religions, we all have to come to a common conclusion. In that, the speaker stated and justified as to how Jesus, Ram, Prophet Muhammad are all equal. Rather, he went to the extent of getting support from certain Indian scriptures and certain Christian scriptures to justify the existence or the status of Prophet Muhammad. It's all very good. But we have been listening over the last two, three years, various conferences which have taken place across the world. The starting point is not by saying that are they all God, are they all equal, or somebody is superior or somebody is inferior. I personally feel that none of us present here in the hall today have ever seen our respective gods. Neither the Muslims have seen Prophet, neither I as a Hindu have seen Ram, neither the Christians have seen Jesus. The more important factor which I will request the speaker to catch on in any of his further talks is human being. The goodness amongst us. When the speaker stated, Hindus say everything is God. It means that there is an element of goodness amongst all of us, which, if nurtured, can make us near to God. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank our brother from the Indian Embassy and, and thank you for his comments. And he mentioned that in most of the interfaith dialogues, he said that he agreed that I tried to prove the commonalities and trying to prove that Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Jesus are messengers. Yes, we agree. Rama, maybe, may not be, you can refer to my talk on similarity with Islam and Hinduism. Maybe, maybe is not. Even if you all you was meant for people of that time, that's what I say. But he said that in the interfaith dialogues, we don't discuss about God no one, he has not seen Rama, Muslim has not seen Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Christian, I mean, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But we have to talk about the qualities, the human values, the human goodness. And when he says that Hindu says everything is God, goodness is there in everything. That's what you're saying, not the scripture. Coming to your point, I do agree. We first talk about the human good qualities. No Muslim can be a good Muslim unless he's a good human being. And number one duty of a human being is he should thank his Creator Almighty God. If you cannot thank and worship your Creator Almighty God, what is the use of you helping your neighbor? Useless. You should help your neighbor. You should help the poor. I'm not against it. But if you disrespect your Creator Almighty God, you cannot thank Him. You cannot worship Him. All your other activities is useless. That's the reason. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116. If Almighty Allah SWT wants, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, He will never forgive. For anyone who does shirk, associate partners with God, He has strayed far away. The biggest sin in Islam is shirk associating partners with God. And similarly, that's what the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 72, that they are doing kufr, those who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, son of Mary, is Allah. 
فقال المسيح بٹ سیٹ کرائس یا بنی اسرائیل او چن آف اسرائیل او عبد اللہ وشپ اللہ ربی و رب کم ہز مائی لارڈ اینڈ یور لارڈ ان نو مے شرک بلا اینی ون و سوسیٹ فارٹنر وت اللہ فقط حرم اللہ علیہ الجنا اللہ مل مے جنت حرام فارم وما وہ نار وما لے ظالمی من انصار اینڈ فائر شیل بی ڈویلنگ پلیس اینڈ ہی شیل ہیو نو ہیلپ ادر ایئر افٹر سو یور دی بگیسٹ سین ان اسلام از شرک سیم تھنگ مینشن ان دی بائبل وٹ آئی کوٹڈ ٹو یو Thou shall not make any images of me. Same thing you mentioned in the Veda. So when you're talking about qualities of human beings, the best quality is quality of thanking our great almighty God. He does not require you and me. You will ask me that why should I thank him? People ask me, why do you say Allah Akbar? Why you have to pray to God? I said, see, in Islam, whether we pray to God or not, it makes no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest, He is already the greatest. By me saying Allah Akbar, He won't become greater. Why do we say? You know why do we say? Because when I praise anyone, whenever I call anyone great, it's a human tendency, I try and follow His commandments. For example, if your mother has a heart attack, and suppose there's a lame man who's a quack, he just comes and tells you that do so and so thing. Will you follow? On the other hand, you come to know of a person who is the most famous heart specialist in the world. He gives you the prescription. Will you follow him or will you follow a common man? But naturally, you will follow the prescription of the best heart specialist in the world. He is the most famous. The moment he is famous, you will follow his prescription if your mother has a heart attack. So the reason we praise Allah is not so that he becomes greater. When we praise Allah, The moment we praise Him, whatever commandments He gives in the Quran, we follow it. So first we have to identify who is our Almighty God. And then what He says, we have to follow. That is the reason Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. Muslim is not by name, Zakir, Abdullah, Muhammad, Sultan. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. Now, what is good is subjective. What you call is good, I may not say it is good. Who is going to say what is good, what is bad? You are going to have a dialogue? The best person who can say what is good or what is bad for the human beings is the creator of the human beings, Almighty God. So unless you don't come to know who is the true Almighty God, what are His attributes, you should worship Him alone and the way you should worship all your other criteria of humanity is useless. The number one criteria is, is thanking our Creator Almighty God. That is the best human quality. And what is good and what is bad for us differs of opinion. Even the doctors differ. The best doctor is the Creator of the human being, Almighty God. He tells you alcohol is prohibited in the Veda, in the Bible, in the Quran. Don't have it. He says pork is prohibited in the Hindu scriptures, in the Bible, in the Quran. Don't have it. Gambling is prohibited. What is good, what is bad, how will you come to know? It is subjective. Therefore, there's a query that do good people go to hell is a question. So I ask you, what is good compared to what humanity thinks is good? Fine, love each other, no problem, girls and boys mixing, pornography, no problem, everything is good. So if this is what you call is good, no problem, intermingling, homosexuality, everything is good. So such good people will surely go to hell. First, you have to realize by the definition what is good. So, do good people go to hell? If these are the criteria for your goodness, they'll go to hell. In religion, no good person can ever go to hell. Who is a good person? Number one, the person who realizes his creator, who respects him, who worships him and follows his commandment. That there is in the interfaith, the most important point is to identify who is our God and to worship him. and no one else, then the messengers, and then the other things. Hope that answers the question, brother. All right, number two, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Swami. I am from India. I work as a project manager in uh, a company here. Okay, uh, I don't have any questions, but uh, the way you talk and the way you have knowledge, I just want to... I cannot appreciate because I am very young uh, in age. I just am grateful that uh, 
you have come here to saudi arabia and i had a very good chance to listen to your lecture though daily i listen to your lecture for about 2 uh, 3 hours in the peach tv which is uh, become my routine because i don't uh, uh, listen to any other speakers uh, except uh, dr zakir nayak when somebody else comes i switch on to mbc tv so i i am grateful that uh, there's opportunity for me to come live and sit in a front row here and uh, they have given a space to in front row i'm grateful to the organization and the organizers and to you also thank you very much thank you brother sami and thank you for testifying that there are many non muslim viewers and i know that mashallah the peace tv is watched by many non muslims and there were complaints from people some of the non muslims here abroad in uk in usa that though our peace tv has got about 75% english and 25% hindi urdu called as hindustani because of that those who understand english only they say what is this urdu coming in between can understand those who understand only urdu they say what is this english coming in between so we had this complaint for a long time and as dr ahmed ibn saifuddin told you earlier that inshallah in the month of june we are going to launch a new channel by the name of peace tv urdu urdu means it will be hindi hindustani so that our main channel peace tv will be 100% english inshallah and this channel would be 100% urdu it will be launched on the same intersat 10 on a bigger bandwidth inshallah so here this part of the world 75% of the world population can see both the channels peace tv main that's in english and peace tv urdu and for people like you we are seeing to it that because i speak english also and urdu also the programs of mine will not overlap when i'm speaking on the english channel i won't be speaking on the urdu channel when i speak on the urdu channel i won't speak on the english channel anyway on average i come only 17% of the times because i don't want to overshadow though i know that i've given many lectures so as a policy we have kept it that i should not appear on the channel for more than 17% so that we want the world to have a variety of the speakers many duars that we have from throughout the world and that's the reason we had the peace conference in 2007 in english last year we had in urdu and again this year inshallah we are going to have in english the peace conference from 30th october to the 8th of november 2009 inshallah thank you can we uh, from the women section we need from mic number 3 any sister there waiting in line assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam now uh, some of our sisters have got some questions the first question is the quran tells us not to be friends the not to make friends with the kafirs not to befriend them now how true is that are we not allowed to befriend them or is it just that we don't trust them but we can befriend them we can talk with them like acquaintances so what is the truth about this thank you sister has asked a question that does the quran say that we should not befriend non muslims can we be acquaintances what the quran says in surah al imran chapter 3 verse number 28 is that don't take for protectors unbelievers in preference to believer where it come for taking as protectors then the quran says that if you have a choice between a believer and unbeliever take believer that's it as far as keeping friendship acquaintances there is no problem you can mix with the non muslims but i always have a question that when we have non muslim friends see it a point that when there is friendship between two human beings either you are influencing him or her or she or he is influencing you you can't say nothing is happening so if you have non muslim friends see to it that you're influencing her or him the way i spoke today don't insult them but talk to them about commonalities and get them closer to the truth of almighty god but if you keep friendship and they are influencing you more then you may deviate away from the truth so when you have non muslim friends very well you can mix with them speak with them but see to point that you should do dawa with them speak the message of truth so that they come to the right path if you don't then you may deviate from the right path so keep friendship keep acquaintances but important is that you do dawa with them hope that answers the question sister thank you do we have anyone else on 
the ladies floor yes it's all right one more please it's on behalf of my sisters okay the second question is the sister says i have heard that clapping and whistling used to be a form of worship in the pagans or some other religions now and similarly birthday celebrations now what is your opinion what is the proper opinion on these are we supposed to participate in these kind of rituals can we clap and can we whistle with what's anything is wrong with celebrating birthdays sister if you had heard the rules of the question answers mm -hmm. i always prefer that first the non muslim should ask the question and if muslim is asking the question ask the question on the topic these questions on fiqh and masail you can ask to the ulama and sheikhs i am a specialist in islam and comparative religion not that i cannot answer these questions i am a specialist on islam and comparative religion ask me questions which are unique you get a heart specialist and ask him that i have a cough now what to do <laughs> not that i cannot answer this question sister therefore i personally prefer first give the opportunity to the non muslims after the non muslims have exhausted the opportunity then the muslims can ask and if the muslims ask please restrict your question to the topic dialogue between religions since the sister asked the first question i allowed her to break the rules second time no problem but see to it that the person who wants to ask the question let her or him ask directly i don't prefer chits and i don't prefer via via question i prefer direct and i am a mashallah mash direct i direct i prefer and when you get direct question the questions are better on the topic these indirect on the chit you know behind the scene behind the direct so therefore i request all the other mics please give first a point to the non muslims let them benefit Muslims can always ask on the email no problem after the non muslim they have exhausted then the muslims can ask but please restrict your question to the topic the sister has the question that she has heard that clapping and whistling is a form of worship and about birthdays can we celebrate quranic verse which does say that clapping and whistling is a form of worship so but natural in our worship we cannot clap we cannot whistle But what about normal clapping? There are differences of opinion between all mas. Some of the shiok say that clapping is not right. Most of the shiok say that because Quranic verse says it's a form of worship. In worship, you cannot clap, you cannot whistle. But otherwise, generally, if it's a culture, as long as it doesn't go against the Quran and Sharia, if it's a gesture of appreciation, best. is allah akbar mashallah no problem but clapping will not come in the haram category it will come in mubah category difference of opinion difference of opinion most say it is mubah some say it is haram if it's an appreciation no problem as far as birthday celebration is concerned again some shiukh say that celebrating birthday is haram some say it is mubah i personally feel that celebrating birthday of personalities especially of religious leaders etc it lead to shirk celebrating birthdays of prophet like whether it be christmas celebrating birthdays of religious personalities it leads to shirk but celebrating birthday per se it can be called as makru because there's no hadith which says that do not celebrate birthdays i don't know any hadith but does say that do not imitate the kuffar So therefore, celebrating birthdays of religious personalities, I feel it leads to shirk. But celebrating birthdays per se, I would call as makru because it leads you away from Islam, like dancing and music, etc. But if someone says I want to celebrate birthday and give Islamic lecture, I cannot say it is <laughs> haram. So how you celebrate birthday depends. Some of the scholars say that birthday is haram. some scholars say that celebrating in the haram way is haram i personally feel celebrating birthdays of religious personalities of famous personalities and anniversary etc is totally haram it leads to shirk but celebrating otherwise muslims i say should not celebrate in our school it's the rule of the school not of the sharia that you should not celebrate birthday so i can put any rule in my school being the chairman of the school which is not against quran sunnah so in my school the rule is no children should celebrate birthday but if you ask me as a fatwa in islam it is preferable not to do it it leads you away from allah and his rasul but birthday per se 
First say, I don't know if any hadith or Quranic verse this says it is haram. So depending upon which scholar do you take the view of? Hope that answers the question, sister. All right. Jazakallahu khairan. Let's take number five, please. And first floor. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, alaikum assalam. Um, engineer Imran, project manager IT. I have uh, some short question. Uh, my professor had a discussion with me and he said, excuse every me, religion... Please, excuse me. Stop, if there please. are any non-Muslims who would like to ask a question on any of the mics, please raise your hand. Yes, let's give the point to non-Muslims first. Yes. They are our special guests today. So give them the first opportunity. Do we? After the non-Muslims finish, okay. we'll come back to the Muslims. Yes, brother. Thank, thank you. If there's any non-Muslim in the queue, please the volunteers request the non-Muslim to come in the front. They can break the queue. This is the rule of the question and session right. with Dr. Zakir Naik. Let's, let's start the with number five there, non-Muslim there. Are they non-Muslim there? All right, please. Okay, fine. If there's non-Muslim, come on the microphone. Hello? Yes, go ahead. I am Saji George. I am working with Saudi Ojar. I'd like to ask you one question. Do you believe in Holy Spirit? Thank you. Brother asked me the question, do you believe in Holy Spirit? I'll ask you, what do you mean by Holy Spirit? <laughs> the word, no, do you believe in God? I believe in God. What is the definition of God is important. If you say Holy Spirit like what the Christians believe, I say no. no. Yes. If you want to say in Archangel Gabriel, yes, I believe in him. I believe in the angels, I believe, but the Holy Spirit like the way the Christians believe, no. But the right way, if you say angel, yes, I believe in the angels, and each angel has been assigned duties by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the angels, the Archangel Gabriel, who got the revelation to the messengers, who also got the revelation to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran, yes, I believe in him. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Number six, he's pleading for a non-Muslim. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Deepak Mishra and I would like to say you Namaste. Um, my question is, uh, actually uh, I am a Hindu and I have married a Muslim girl in India and inshallah she will be here in uh, Saudi Arabia in coming next month. You know what, when I told her that I will be going to visit uh, Dr. Zakir Nayak's speech, so she told, please don't go to him. Uh, he says bad about Shias and she's a Shia actually. So, uh, she, she told, no, don't, do, don't go to him and uh, her mother-in-law also told, no, please, you don't go. If you go to him, he will tell you bad about Shia and you will leave me. So, uh, that is the first doubt which I am having in my mind. And the second thing is, uh, I, have a, I have a generic question in the sense that if we say that everything is God and uh, everything belongs to God in Hindu and Muslim religion, so why... God wants everybody of us to worship Him. Why is He created us uh, in any forms of religion uh, when you talk about the creation? Why is He created us? Why He wants us to worship? Why He wants us to take so much of pains to worship Him? And why He doesn't ask animal or anybody else to worship Him? Why only human beings? Thanks. Brother, there are two questions. Before he asked the question, he told me Namaste. Brother, do you know the meaning of Namaste? Uh, no. <laughs> People say hi. And what is the meaning of hi? Even I say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The meaning is may peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be on you. You told me namaste. I have to reply. Correct? And if I don't reply, you'll tell me what kind of a person is he. Correct? I'm asking you what is the meaning of namaste. You now see, uh, for me, Namaste is like, I am saying hi to you, I am saying Assalamu Alaikum to you. But yeah, for I... you, please forgive me. If I abuse you and I tell, my abuse means you are a good person. Will you believe in that? If, if I see, know the if, word. If I tell Ullu, you know Ullu. <laughs> Ullu in Urdu, Hindi means Aul. In English, Aul means a wise person. But Ullu in Hindi means what? Ullu means? Bevakuf. Yeah, Bevakuf. So the, so the English people will think I'm praising you, calling you a wise person. But you know I'm calling you a fool. Now I know the meaning of Namaste. That's the reason I didn't reply yet. You don't know the meaning. You have told me Namaste. I know the meaning, therefore I didn't reply. The meaning of Namaste is, it comes from the Sanskrit word idam namame. Meaning I bow down to you. Do you want to bow down to me? Absolutely. 
you can bow down to the person who is having so much of knowledge that's right according to you you can bow down to a person of knowledge but according to the quran and according to islam and most of the religions you bow down to no one but almighty god you know there are many hindus after i give a talk they come and touch my feet you know what they say humne pehle baar bhagwan ka avatar khud dekha aankh se it's the first time in my life i have met god himself personally hindu telling me so i didn't see brother i know you respect me you love me appreciate that but bowing to anyone besides god is shirk and even in hinduism you should bow down to no one but almighty god so i'm correcting him he's doing out of respect out of love but love and respect should not go overboard if it goes overboard it's called as shirk associating partner with god there are many hindus who come after me and they praise me so much they put me next to god which i said i am not god you can only bow down to almighty god what i speak and the knowledge is a gift from god this is a gift from god so when you see me you should say mashallah mashallah means as allah will me what i am saying is because of the will of almighty god otherwise i was a stammerer so that the reason namaste is against islam and against actually even the hindu scriptures though some of the scholars say that idam namamet can mean that i appreciate you but the right meaning is i bow down to you in islam assalamu alaikum may peace be on you you can say that any time anywhere in english we say good morning it may be raining cats and dogs here to say good morning the person may have had a fight with his wife someone says good morning has to wish back good morning he is cursing in his heart that such a morning should never come <laughs> yet he has to reply by good morning good evening good night so best in islam is assalamu alaikum may peace be and i wish you because the quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 86 that if anyone greets you courteously wish back more courteously that if anyone greets you courteously wish back more courteously or at least the same so i am wishing you back assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may allah's peace and mercy be on you brother now coming back to your question so the first question you asked that your fiance fiance or your wife my wife wife oh you already married her fine your wife told you not to come for my lecture because i'm against shia and yet you disobeyed her you know you love me so much i appreciate that but but you know why the word shia doesn't exist in the quran see the shia sunni is not mentioned in the quran the quran says in surah imran chapter 3 verse number 103 wa tasimu bi habli lai jamia wa la tafarraku hold to the rope of allah strongly and be not divided we muslims should hold to the rope of allah strongly and be not divided and almighty god says in the quran in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 159 that o prophet anyone who makes sex in the religion of islam you have nothing to do with him allah will look after his affairs on the day of judgment so making sex in the religion of islam is prohibited so anyone who divides the religion of islam into sex he is going away from quran and sunna so tell your wife that dr zakir naik said there is nothing like shia sunni quran says ati allah wa ati rasul obey allah and obey the messenger what we have to do is we have to follow the quran and the sayings the authentic sayings of prophet muhammad peace be upon him and the only label you can give is muslim so i don't call myself shia sunni i call myself muslim so you say today to your wife i met dr zakir naik who calls himself a muslim and i am neither against sunni nor neither against shia i tell all the muslims whatever name they call themselves come back to allah and his rasul now when i give answer some of the muslims who may be practicing things against the quran and sunna may feel offended so you ask your wife are you following something against the quran and sunna if you are not then why are you doctor zakir nai if you are yes you have to change and come back to quran and sunna don't follow what zakir says zakir is zero in islam atullah what your rasul obey allah and obey the messenger so tell your wife if she is following anything against the quran and say hadith then she has to rectify herself she should call herself a muslim because the word she has no way mentioned in the quran so well, i do appreciate that you love your wife but you love me also mashallah therefore i have come from it off 
Now coming to your second question, that why has God created us and why does God want us to worship him? Why doesn't he ask the animals to worship him? Now regarding a question, why does God want us to worship? I've already given the answer earlier. I think you came late, I don't know. That we worship God, we praise him. People ask me, why do you say Allah Akbar? Why you have to pray to God? I said, see, in Islam, whether we pray to God or not, it makes no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest, he's already the greatest. By me saying Allah Akbar, he won't become greater. Why do we say? You know why do we say? Because when I praise anyone, whenever I call anyone great, it's a human tendency, I try and follow his commandments. So the reason we praise Allah is not so that he becomes greater. When we praise Allah, the moment we praise him, whatever commandments he gives in the Quran, we follow it. So first we have to identify who is our almighty God. And then what he says we have to follow. That is the reason Muslim means a person who submits his will to almighty God. Quran mentions in Surah Dariyat, chapter 51, verse 56, that we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. Almighty God has created us to worship him. And the reason he wants us to worship him because he has given us the criteria. This is the instruction manual for the human being. The good and bad for the human being. Now when we worship him, when we praise him, but naturally we have to follow his commandments. And when we follow the commandments of Almighty God, it is beneficial for us. Like for example, when you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription, do you follow his prescription or not? Yes. Yes. Why? Because you're sick. He's a doctor. Similarly, Almighty God has prescribed us in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith what is good and bad for the human being. When we praise him, when we worship him, but naturally we follow his commandments. If you don't believe the person is a doctor and if he gives you a prescription, will you follow it? No. So when you appreciate the doctor, you will follow his prescription. That's the reason we praise Almighty God and we worship him so that we can be good practicing human beings. You ask the question, why don't the animals worship him? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad he said that in Islam, all the other creations, except for the human beings and the jinn, they have a free will. All the other creations, they don't have a free will. The angels don't have a free will. The animals don't have a free will. All of them, they worship Almighty God. The animals, the trees, the mountains, all of them, they worship Almighty God. They are called as Muslims in Arabic. The jinn and the human beings, Almighty God has given us a free will. We can either follow him or disobey him. Now, Almighty God created us because, it's mentioned in the Quran, that the best creation of Almighty God is the human being. Besides our form and our body and the intelligence, he has given us a free will. We can either obey him or disobey him. Now, after he's given us a free will, he wants to analyze whether do we obey him or not. All the other creatures like animals, trees, they have no free will. So it's nothing great that they worship Almighty God. It's good, Alhamdulillah. But after a free will has been given to the human beings, as the Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawata wal hayata. It's Allah who has given you death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for us for the hereafter. So after the free will has been given to us, you can either worship Him or not worship Him. If you worship Him, then you're following the commandment of God. You can have alcohol, you cannot have alcohol. If you don't have alcohol, then you're following his commandment. So in this way, Almighty God has given you the do's and don'ts. Very few. The remaining thing, everything is optional on you. So these few do's and don'ts, if you take care of it, you are following the commandments, you're worshipping him, and you will pass this test. This life is a test for the hereafter. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. We have a non-Muslim here. Please. Uh, my name is Romeo. My, uh, I'm presently working in uh, network engineer. Okay. My question is regarding, since our topic is the religion, my question is about jihad. You know, most of the Filipinos, they see, or the West people, or in my opinion, most of the people see that Muslims are the ones who are creating troubles in the world because of jihad. As far as I know, I read, Jihad is protecting your uh, your religion. If your religion is going to die, if it's like something is threatening your religion, then that's the time for jihad. But 
I see jihad nowadays as as like distractions of people. You know, in Muslims, being a Muslim, I just joined the Muslim two months back. And this question comes to me, and I want to clear, I want to clear to some people, and why Muslims are starting the fight. And you know, we are as Christians before, we don't like troubles. We are a peace people. So I don't know what is your opinion regarding this jihad. Thanks. Brother asked the question that he wants to clarify the concept of jihad, and he feels that jihad, the Muslims fight, because religion is dying, and he believes Christians are very peace-loving, etc. Jihad is the Arabic word which comes from jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. In Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against your own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to fight against oppression. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. And this strive and struggle is mentioned in most of the scriptures. But unfortunately, what the media portrays, they translate jihad as the holy war. Holy war in Arabic means harbu muqaddasa. This word harbu muqaddasa no way appears in the Quran in none of the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad So holy war is a wrong translation of the Arabic word jihad. This holy war, if you go back to history, was first used to describe the Christians, the crusaders, who spread the religion of Christianity by force. Those who did not accept Christianity, they forced them to death. So these crusaders, the word holy war initially was used for the crusaders. Unfortunately today, the word holy war is used for the Muslims. So you say we were Christian peace loving. If you go back to history, the people who killed the maximum people in the name of religion, they were Christians. If you go back to history. I'm talking about history, I'm not talking about your Philippines. We're talking about the, but we're talking now the present. Present, present time also. If you see my talk on jihad and terrorism, the biggest terrorist on the face of the earth was George Bush. Christian. Okay. Uh, huh? Now, now, now George Bush has gone. So it's all story. I know. It's now Obama has come. Well, I hate George Bush also. Very That's good. That's why we kicked them in the Philippines. Very good. Mashallah, I'm for you, brother. I love you, brother. <laughs> so now coming to the question. So jihad actually means to strive to struggle. It does not mean holy war. It means to strive and struggle. And jihad, fi sabilillah, means striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every Muslim should do jihad. What I'm doing today is jihad. I'm striving and struggling to give the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm doing jihad. So jihad is a various type. Every Muslim should keep on doing jihad every day of his life, every moment, strive and struggle. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Now, let's proceed here, please. Thank you. Go ahead, brother. My name is Vijay Kumar. I'm working in National Battery Company as a production engineer. This is the second year. I'm coming here to hear your lecture. And I love to hear your work, uh, lectures. And uh, really, I appreciate your memory, this thing. Uh, as you are going from the book to book and version to version, uh, really, I uh, love to hear that one. And uh, the present question is regarding peace. The present, uh, if you see the throughout the world, the peace has been uh, reshuffled everywhere throughout the world. See, how to restore the peace using all these religions? Your opinion, please. Thank you. Brother, that's a very good question. That how to restore peace? The peace is being reshuffled. Like I had given a talk, peace, the cry of war mongers. Peace, the cry of war mongers. Those who say peace, peace, the other people are creating the biggest war in the world. So I do agree with you. How to restore peace? Same way. If you know Islam, is Arabic word which comes from the root word salam and silm. Salam means peace. And silm means to submit your will to God. So best way to acquire peace is to submit your will to Almighty God. So the best way you can acquire peace in this world and the hereafter is to submit your will to Almighty God. So this topic that we had dialogue between religions, whether you're a Hindu, you're a Jew, or a Christian, or a Muslim. I've spoken about common points in all these scriptures. So let us agree today. 
What is different we can discuss tomorrow, right or wrong? At least we agree there is one God. Let us all of us agree one God, worship Him alone, no one is. Let us follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad and his teachings. Let us pray to Almighty God. Let us do sajda prostration. Let us give charity, 2.5% of excess wealth every lunar year. Let us, if God wills, go to pilgrimage. Let us abstain from alcohol, abstain from pork, abstain from gambling. At least this can be a starting point. Now, if we follow the commandments of Almighty God and submit our will to Almighty God, you will get peace internally and externally in this world as well as the hereafter. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. All right. Probably uh, we have last two questions. It's getting late and we don't want to hold you for long. My name is Sebastian. My faith is Christian. Okay. So, I, I would like to ask and you… And your profession, please. My profession, I am working as an accounts manager in a telecommunication company in Riyadh. Okay. So, I am very much happy to be here and heard your speech. You have started with the similarity of the religions and from the speech, you have told to find out the hundred percent of the faith. So, from your speak, I came to the conclusion that Islam is the hundred percent faith to be followed. So, I would like to ask you that can you clearly emphasize about the hundred percent of Islam? This is the only question I have. Thank you. Thank you. The brother said that he heard the lecture and he has come to the conclusion that Islam is 100% the true religion, alhamdulillah. And he wants me to clarify openly. But naturally, since it's an interfaith dialogue, taking out the commonalities, I say, submit your will to Almighty God, the same way the chief editor so I, don't you finally say Islam is the only right religion? I said, no, I say, submitting your will to Almighty God is the right religion. Because sometimes Islam may not go down the throat. The word Muslim will not go down the throat. So I say, submitting your will to Almighty God is the right religion. But if you want to say clearly, and Almighty God clearly mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the deen in the lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 85 that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. He'll be among the loser in the hereafter. So Islam, submitting of will to Almighty God is the only religion which is correct and all the prophets of Almighty God taught only this. Now brother, I'm asking you the question that do you agree Islam is the best religion? Do you accept Islam? No, then I have to think it over. Do you believe there is one God? I believe in one God. Do you believe that God has got no images? Yes, there is no one image God other than single God. Single God. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final that, messenger? That's a thing which I have actually want to ask you because as per our faith, my faith which I am practicing now, Jesus is the last uh, prophet. Uh, our Faith, people's, that's the reason I, why I am asking about the 100%. I am not talking what your religious priest has told you. Uh -huh. Can you point out one verse in the Bible which says that Jesus Christ is the last messenger? No, I am not uh, by heart at the Bible. I am a student of comparative religion. There is not a single verse in the Bible saying that Jesus is the last messenger. In fact, I quote it to you. Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hear shall he speak. He shall glorify me. Now, who is the spirit of truth? Which religious personality has praised Jesus Christ besides Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Who? And Jesus is mentioned in the Quran, peace be upon him, by name, no less than 25 times. So, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is talking about a messenger to come. And this messenger 
is no one but the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him hope that answers the question thank you all right we have something for you before you go because we have probably one or two questions there the last ones and then uh, we have a surprise announcement coming soon so this is like they do on TV right <laughs> so this is this is what we're going to do uh, question from here please Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum my, name is, my name is Mohan my, I'm working for national paints okay my question is the Holy Quran is from God how can you prove it all right thank you brother asked me the question that how can you prove that the glorious Quran is from Almighty God brother I've given a lecture is the Quran God's word which is about approximately two hours lecture for the question and session for another one and a half two hours we don't intend doing here but surely I would ask one of the volunteers to give you that DVD is the Quran God's word because even if I have to give in short the answer will take it at least 15 20 minutes not that I'm running away from the answer okay fine at least in a few minutes I'll just try the time is short that is the only thing suppose and ask this question to an atheist and even to a person who does not believe in the Quran that suppose there is an object which is given to you who no one in the world has ever seen before and is brought in front of you and ask the question who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this object who no one in the world has seen as I'm asking the question suppose there is something which is brought in front of you there's an equipment who no one in the world has seen before and if I ask you the question who will be the first person who will tell you the mechanism of this new object who creator very good some will say creator some will say manufacturer some will say producer some will say inventor whatever it is keeping in your mind now I ask your next question that's how did our universe come into existence the person of knowledge will tell us that first our universe was one primary nebula then there was a secondary separation to the Big Bang which gave us to galaxies the stars the Sun and the planet earth on which we live when did you come to know he will tell you we came to know about 35 years back 40 years back Big Bang now this thing is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 30 where it's mentioned kafru. do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kana that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder this Big Bang we're talking about is mentioned in the Quran in a nutshell 1400 years ago some will say maybe it's a fluke no problem don't argue with it I ask the next question what is the shape of the earth so the person will tell me that the shape of the earth is spherical when I ask the question when did you come to know he will tell that recently 100 years back 200 years back previously we thought that the earth is flat it was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake he sailed around the earth and he proved that the earth was spherical the Quran mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Naziyat chapter number 79 verse number 30 wal ard baad azalika dahaha and thereafter we have made the earth egg shaped and today we know that the world is not completely round like a ball it is geospherical in shape it is starting from the pole and bulging from the center and the Arabic word the haha refers to the egg of an ostrich and if you analyze the shape of an egg of an ostrich is geospherical in shape who could have mentioned that the earth is geospherical in shape in the Quran 1400 years ago someone will say okay maybe a prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was very intelligent don't argue continue when we ask the atheist or a person who doesn't believe in the Quran that the light of the moon is it is its own light or reflected light so he will tell us that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light recently 100 years back 200 years back we came to know that the light of the moon is reflected light of the Sun the Quran mentions in Surah Furqan chapter 25 verse 61 that the light of the moon is borrowed light it described as Munir or Noor borrowed light or reflected light who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago when I was in school I had learned that the earth and the moon they revolved and they rotated but the sun was stationary it did not rotate about its own axis Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 33 
Who will the Zik Halaka Lal Wan Nahara? It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Washams of Kamar, the sun and the moon. Kulun Fifaliki has Bahun, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, they are also rotating about their own axis. Today we have come to know that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 49 years ago that the sun rotates about its own axis? Furthermore, Recently, we came to know that the universe is expanding. It was Edwin Hubble who mentioned this. Quran mentions 14 years ago in Surah Dariyat, chapter 51, verse 47, that the universe is expanding. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. The water evaporates from the ocean, rises up, forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down the head in several places. In Surah Azumur chapter 39 verse 21, in Surah Mu'minun chapter 23 verse number 18, in Surah Rum chapter number 30 verse 24, in Surah Hijar chapter 15 verse 22, in Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 43. I can go on and quoting only the references of the water cycle in the Quran. Who could have mentioned this? We came to know recently in our school we are taught that Bernard Palissy was the first person who described the water cycle in 1580 which is mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago. Who could have mentioned this earlier? Now there will be a big pause. I can go on. We did not know that the plants are sexes. Quran mentions 14 years ago in Surah Taha chapter 20 verse 53 that the plants have sexes male and female. Recently we have come to know that the two types of water, salt and sweet, and there is a barrier between them which cannot be trespassed. It is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Rahman chapter 55 verse number 19 and 20. It is also mentioned in Surah Furqan chapter 25 verse 53 about the same thing. The Quran speaks about embryology, the Quran speaks about medicine, the Quran speaks about genetics. I can go on and give a lecture of us together. Who could have mentioned this 14 years ago? Brother, who could have mentioned that? What is the answer? Who? Creator, creator, manufacturer, inventor, producer, this creator, this manufacturer, this inventor, we Muslims call as Allah, which you call as God. So this Quran can be proved scientifically that the word of God. Because Quran, the word of God is far superior to science. Today, science is the yardstick for many of them. I am not trying to take the help of science. I am using your yastik science along with my yastik the Quran which is far superior and I am trying to prove to you what your yastik has mentioned today Quran has mentioned 14 years ago. So with the help of your yastik the science I am trying to prove to the non-Muslims that the Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God who we call as Allah. For more details refer to my video cassette is the Quran God's word in which various ways I have proved that Quran is the word of God. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. But let me give you a good news because of lectures tonight and Allah's guidance subhanahu wa ta'ala. One sister is ready to announce her shahada tonight. Can we have the sister with us? Please. Sister. Okay. By the time she gets ready, I call upon uh, Brother Abdul Malik Mujahid. Please come forward because you have a great announcement for translating uh, a book by Darus Salaam, by Dr. Zakir. And of course, is a presentation here, a gift. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a book uh, for Dr. Zakir Naik, Quran and Modern Science. And uh, we translate this book in Arabic. In a matter of fact, we need to translate all of his book in many, many languages. But alhamdulillah, we start this book in Arabic. And this is the first copy which I am presenting to Dr. Zakir Naik. So this is a translation we, into Arabic uh, just, uh, of his book, right? One minute's book uh, more. And I have a few, few words about Dar Islam and about your publications. MashaAllah, once again, I am thankful to Abdul Malik Mujahid. MashaAllah, and as you know that I've said that several times before, 
that has fulfilled a great requirement, especially in the English-speaking world, where we have lack of English books which are based on Quran and Hadith is authentic. And Alhamdulillah, one of the largest English collections having authentic books based on Quran and Sayyid Hadith is Darus Salaam, Alhamdulillah. And he's been kind enough even to publish some of my books. And he said that he'll be translating most of them different languages. One of my earlier books in Urdu. And now he has done in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward him. May Darus Salaam grow more so that they could spread the true word of Islam throughout the world, even amongst the non-Muslims of different languages. Jazakallah shukran. May Allah give Darus Salaam more power Thank you very much. to help spread the Islamic knowledge, inshallah, and uh, translate more of the works of Dr. Zakir, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, I'm sure that uh, because of tonight and because of the many Alhamdulillah lectures and, and, uh, and because of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many will have their inshallah hearts open to accepting the truth, accepting Islam. We have a non-Muslim. Do we have a last one? Non-Muslim there? Please, the last question. Hello, my name is uh, Anu Suman and I'm working as a network consultant in Saudi in STC. First of all, I will thank you um, for a very knowledgeable uh, I mean, lecture which I was hearing for the past one hour. I just want to ask one basic simple question, I mean, uh, is why should one follow any religion? Because what I receive from all the Vedas or from hearing from you, uh, the, the Quran also is, if a man can or a, a human being can uh, do kindness to another human being, and if he can do that, then why should he actually follow any religion? Thank you. No, that's a good question. He asked the question, why should a human being follow religion? If you can be kind to one another human being, that's sufficient. Now, brother, what is the definition of kind? Who will tell you? You have to be good to any other human being. Who will tell you what is good or what is bad? So, as religion basically means a way of life. A way of life. When you grow up, somebody teaches you the language. The parents teach you what is good, what is health, what is no. When you are sick, who do you go to? Doctor. Why? Why? Because he can advise you more. Okay. Correct. So we follow religion. Why? Because we know our creator knows the best what is good, what is bad for us. You go to a doctor because doctor is expert in curing diseases. But our creator is the best of doctors. All doctors put together, he has more knowledge. So he tells you from start what is good, what is bad for you. Otherwise, it is like a person who is just string and he starts and stumbles. He may try and find something right, something wrong. How will you come to know? For example, you go in a forest and you want to eat fruit. If you don't know about the forest life, you may pluck a fruit which is poisonous and you may poison yourself. Would you prefer asking someone that which fruit is poisonous or not? If you're intelligent, you will not pick up just wild berries. You may get poisoned. So you'll ask a person who's expert, who knows about the trees in the forest. Similarly, we follow religion because our creator knows what is good, what is bad for us. If you behave like a person not asking anyone, you may stumble. You may say, what is wrong in robbing? If I ask you, robbing is good or bad? Robbing is bad. Why it is bad? See, if I rob, I can take the money, I can see movie. I can go and have food. I can enjoy life. Why it is bad? Uh, for me, uh, it's bad because I am uh, taking someone else's uh, you know, pleasure, for, I mean, wealth for my pleasure. But what is wrong in taking somebody else's wealth for my pleasure? What is wrong? No, that's what I am telling you. I mean, uh, what, what I thought is like uh, all human or my brother, whatever, should, should be treated equal. You tell me one thing that if I take your wealth and I am enjoying it, it is good for me. Why it is bad? It is good for you in the, in, in the case you are... You are uh, so, uh, so that I want something to be good for me. So if you are losing money, how it is causing harm to me? How it is bad? Robbing is good or bad? It's good. Give me one logical reason why it is bad and stop robbing. Only one. One logical reason why robbing is bad and stop robbing. It's good for me, why it is bad? I mean, uh, robbery is good for you and uh, you I mean, uh, as per all the Vedas or all the things you are telling, I mean, 
what uh, it's it's good if you follow in the right path robbing is good no no if something is good if I'm you follow in the right you, path i am asking a simple question robbing is good or bad you say it is bad i asked you a question give me one logical reason why robbing is bad and i stop i am a logical person i am a scientific person logical and scientific give me one good reason why robbing is bad and stop robbing with all your logic with all your science, whatever your reason you give you cannot prove logically if you say that someone will rob you i'll say that i have got 10 bodyguards around me no one can rob me if you tell police will catch me i said police is in my pocket i'm influential you cannot prove robbing is bad with all your logic only way i can prove it is bad if i come back to religion that even if you rob and if you go scot free in this world in the year after you will be punished so if i don't follow religion i can be a drunkard i can be a robber i can be a rapist you cannot prove to me logically why robbing is bad you cannot prove to me logically why raping is bad i am enjoying logically you can't you may say the person is feeling hurt as a what different does it make to me i am enjoying life why it is wrong if i am raping a girl i am enjoying what is wrong you cannot prove logically it is bad only when logically you can prove it is bad even if you enjoy in this world in the year after our god our creator will punish you he'll put you in hell so besides believing in god you also have to believe in year after for example hitler hitler insinuated 6 million jews today if you catch hitler logically what punishment can you give him what punishment can you give him logically nothing maximum you can kill him correct one what about the remaining 5 million 9 lakh 999000 people in religion in islam quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 56 that as to those who reject our signs we shall cast them in the hell fire and as often as the skins are roasted we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain that means if almighty god wants to punish hitler in the year after he can insinuate him 6 million times here we cannot here you kill him finish is dead you can burn him only logically you can't give any punishment so logical punishment if not in this world can mean the year after so therefore basically to good human being you have to believe in religion you have to identify who is our god you have to identify what is good and what is bad for the human beings then only will be on the straight path I hope that answers the question wa akhiru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alamin so much uh, let me at the end